Hello and welcome to the 2022 History Detectives. My name is Christine Byron and I am representing the Grand Rapids Historical Commission. In this a two part program, part two will be done by George Bayard from the Grand Rapids African American Museum and Archives. Um, besides serving uh, on the Grand Rapids Historical Commission, I am a member of a couple different local historical societies. I'm an active member in the West Michigan Postcard Club and serve on the Library of Michigan's uh, Michigan Notable Book Selection Committee. I retired from my position as a local history librarian at the Grand Rapids Public Library, but still loving do doing research. I'm an avid reader of Michigan history and have collected old Michigan tourist and travel memorabilia for over 25 years. My particular interest is in the history of Michigan tourism and travel. My husband and I have written five books in our Vintage View series that focus on history of Michigan tourism. And our sixth book, Historic Leelanau, Recognized Sites and Places of Historical Significance, is a fundraiser for the Leelanau County Historic Preservation Society. Tom and I have done presentations on our books, as well as topics as varied as Michigan dude ranches and mid-century modern roadside architecture. My continued research um, in the history of tourism brought me to my interest in the Green Book. So now I'm going to start the sharing of the screen. and begin the presentation. Okay, here we are. So the title of the presentation is Researching the Other Side of the Story Using Historical Black Newspapers. And as I mentioned, this is a two-part series. I am gonna be doing part one, Researching Michigan Places in the Negro Motorist Green Book. So um, the database that I'm gonna be using, uh, as well as a few other sources, is available through the Grand Rapids Public Library. And it's the ProQuest Historical Newspapers, the Black Newspaper Collection. And it covers the years 1893 to 2010. It includes 10 African-American newspapers. Now those years are the range, not every single newspaper has that exact same range. And I've asterisked the three that tend to have more of the Michigan content, the Michi uh, Chicago Defender, the Michigan Chronicle, and the Pittsburgh Courier. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of the types of things that you may find in these historical black newspapers. This is a photo montage from the Chicago Defender of 1950, um, talking about idle days in Idlewild. You can see people relaxing and reading the paper, going for a bike ride, boating, and so forth. But there's also articles that are much more in depth. The one on your left from the Atlanta Daily World talks about Detroit's Hotel Gotham is going to be featured uh, in uh, the August issue of Ebony Magazine. And the one on the right is from the Michigan Chronicle, originally from May of 1945 and reprinted here. Uh, it's an article by Langston Hughes on the, that same hotel, the Detroit's Hotel Gotham. And there are lots of ads, uh, which was of particular interest to me studying you know, tourism and travel. And these are four ads for Detroit hotels that were listed in the Green Book and they all came from the Chicago Defender at various years. And then there were the social columns and those are really interesting. Uh, the two on the left are from the Chicago Defender and probably the best known one is Zagging with Ziggy by Ziggy Johnson. And if you happen to have read Black Bottom Saints by Alice Randall, that book is based on Ziggy Johnson and he, she did a lot of her research reading the columns that he wrote. The one on the bottom, Social World, that particular issue is from Flint, Michigan. And then on the right, there are two examples of columns from the Michigan Chronicle, Other People's Business by June Brown, that particular issue is on Ida Wild, and Gracefully Yours by Gracie Sadler, who tended to cover the Detroit scene. 
And then I just wanted to point out there are some relatively recent um, things too in these newspapers. Um, the Michigan Chronicle is the one that goes up to 2010. And this was from 1997. And it was a list of the businesses that used to be in Paradise Valley, the hotels, the restaurants, the bars, uh, other businesses and so forth. And then also in the Michigan Chronicle in October of 2009, there was a, quite a big article about Idlewild getting five historical markers. Moving on to the Green Book. A lot of people's awareness um, was brought to their attention from the 2019 Academy Award winner, the Green Book. Um, and the character, Don Shirley, stays in places that he found in the Green Book, but he tended to, in the movie, stay in places that were kind of hole in the wall, restaurants and so forth. But the Green Book did also offer suggestions for more luxurious accommodations. At the time of the Green Book, Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws prevailed. Of course, separate drinking fountains. Uh, the Jim Crow really ran from about 1877 to 1964. And it, um, there were laws pr that promoted white supremacy in every aspect of daily life, including travel. Public transportation was a ritual humiliation. There was separate colored waiting rooms. You might have had to sit at the back of the bus and so forth. And none of the mainstream travel guides were helpful for African-American travelers who knew those books could not be trusted to help black motorists travel in a segregated society. Black travelers learned about possible accommodations by word of mouth or through advertisements and articles in African-American newspapers like the Pittsburgh Courier, Chicago Defender, and Michigan Chronicle. And I'm gonna be using examples of those three papers throughout the presentation. The Green Book was not the first African-American travel guide published, but it was the most prominent and long lasting. In 1930, Hackley and Harrison's Hotel and Apartment Guide for Colored Travelers was published and then followed actually in 39 and 41, there were two editions put out by the US Travel Bureau of Negro Hotels and Guest Houses. And that was followed by the African-American newspapers out of Baltimore, publishing the travel guide of Negro hotels and guest houses. And then the longest um, one besides the Green Book was the travel guide, which ran from 40, 1946 to 1955. And that was similar to the Green Book, but a much smaller thing. And it did tend to focus more on civil rights and it gave the addresses of the NAACP headquarters in the large cities. So the green books weren't called green because of the covers, but because Victor Green was an African-American postal employee from Harlem. After seeing a travel guide for Jewish people, he had the idea to provide a guidebook for black motorists negotiating travel. At first, he relied on a network of postal employees across the country that fed him names of businesses that welcomed African-Americans. Then recommendations came in from readers, green sales agents, and solicitations from advertising. Green hoped that the Negro Motorist Green Book would mean as much, if not more, to the black traveler as the AAA guide meant to the white traveler. His goal was to list places where African-American travelers could stay or do business without aggravation. In an age of segregation, sundown towns, and lynching, the Green Book became an indispensable tool for safe travel. The first edition of the Negro Motorist Green Book was published in 1936, but there are no known existing copies. The 1937 edition had 16 pages, but only listed New York businesses. In 1938, the guide expanded to 24 pages, covering 21 states, but including only Detroit in the Michigan section. By 1939, the guide doubled in size to 48 pages with 44 states included. The Green Book was published through 1966-67 with the exception of the war years, 1942 through 1945 and 1965 was not published. Over its 25 year history, the Green Book grew from a small pamphlet to 125 page book. 
The title was modified a few times over the years, but always focused on the Green Book as the key part of the title. By the 1959 edition, Victor's wife, Alma, was in charge of the entire Green Book operation. Victor died in 1960, four years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Green Book listed welcoming resorts, hotels, tourist homes, restaurants, as well as black owned businesses like barbershops, beauty salons, taverns, nightclubs, and other establishments. The Green Book was available at Esso gas stations, newsstands, select stores, and by subscription. Green established partnerships with the US Travel Bureau and several travel clubs for distribution. By 1954, circulation was estimated at 1 million and by 1962 at more than 2 million. In the course of publication, the Green Book included 240 listings of Michigan places. So I'm gonna move on to those Michigan places in the Green Book and I'm certainly not gonna talk about all 240. Um, this is a shortened version of a, a more full length presentation on Michigan places in the Green Book. So my, as I said, my interest is in the history of Michigan tourism. So I'm approaching the Green Book from that perspective. I can't really tell the whole story of what it was like to be an African American traveling in the segregated South, you know, as a white person. Um, and my interest was aroused probably about, I don't know, six or eight years ago um, when I first heard about the Green Book and I wondered what Michigan places were listed. My focus is on accommodations, restaurants, and entertainment. Now, there were a lot of private guest homes listed in the Green Book, um, but I'm not going to focus on any of those. And for most Michigan towns, they just included lodgings, sometimes a few restaurants, but Idlewild and Detroit had larger listings, and especially Detroit would list other types of businesses like uh, beauty salons, barbershops, car dealers, and so forth. Um, and I'm gonna focus just on listings in the Green Book and not other places, even though there were certainly other places that African-Americans could stay. So as I did my research, I contacted various historical societies, museums and libraries and so forth, researching mostly for images. Um, and I also searched the mainstream Michigan travel guides, uh, both you know from, uh, the East Michigan Tourist Association, West Michigan Tourist Association, and so forth. And I only found three places that were listed in the Green Book that were also listed in some of these mainstream publications. And of course, there's books and magazines that cover uh, some of these places, especially Idlewild and Detroit. So our journey is going to begin down in the southern part of the state at Vandalia with the Paradise Lake Resort. Now for each of these places, I've listed in parentheses the years that they were listed in the Green Book. Now they probably were in business much more than that one year, um, probably you know before that and after that, but I have just listed the years they were in, included in the Green Book. They did run an ad in the 1959 edition and the Pittsburgh Courier in 1956 talk about that they had 40 rooms uh, and it was owned and operated by the amiable Dr. A.W. Gray, a prominent Chicago MD. In Constantine, there was the Double J Ranch that was listed throughout the 50s. And that was a time period where dude ranches were really popular and is owned by Jean Jones, a former singer. And she advertised that she was Michigan's finest dude ranch. And this little piece came from the Chicago Defender in 1950 that Joe and Marva Lewis's children visited the Double J Ranch. And there's Jackie on the left and Punchy being held by Jean Jones on the right. In Pawpaw, there was the Trails End Resort, Glover's Chai Acres, sometimes also called Chai Trails End Resort. The names kind of varied a little bit year to year. They had a nice ad in the Green Book in 54, and the Pittsburgh Courier talked about their beautiful location on Eagle Lake, 
where fishing, swimming, and boating dominate to work up an appetite, which will be justified and satisfied with Magnolia Glover's magic culinary art. In Covert, there were several places listed, and you may know Covert as being a segregated uh, town from the 1860s, uh, integrated town from the 1860s. And this is Pitchford's La Maison, and in, uh, in conjunction with that was Pitchford's Big Tower Child Camp, an ad from 56, and then a little write-up in the Pittsburgh Courier that talked about um, Margaret Pitchford's delectables and all the vegetables are fresh from their own 20 acres of sprawling farmland. And in speaking of food at Pitchford's, you can be assured of Palmer House service. Hubby Joseph A. Pitchford has served the elites of the world during his 30 years at Chicago's renowned Palmer House. And here's a postcard image of it that I only found this past fall. I was so excited. And the back advertises uh, how to get there, either by auto or by bus. In South Haven, there were a couple places listed. And Mrs. Johnson's Shady Nook Farm, ran, she ran an ad in 1949 uh, in the Green Book. And an article from the News Palladium out of Benton Harbor in 1966 uh, talked about Mrs. Mary Johnson has been making miracles in her kitchen at Shady Nook Resort near Lakota for 32 years. Mrs. Johnson is an elderly Negro lady who has a partnership in the resort business that was with her actually with her brother, operates a special food catering service in southwestern Michigan, and has trained nearly 400 young men and women in the fine art of formally receiving and serving dinner guests. There are four dining rooms, two kitchens, and adjoining apartments, and it goes on to give more details about the resort. Another one in South Haven was Simmons Evergreen Resort and the Chicago Defender ran this uh, three photo montage um, and talked about another delightful day in the country was last Sunday's picnic outing, which lured a fashionable crowd of social elites to enjoy a full day's relaxation and fun at the popular Simmons Evergreen Resort near South Haven. In Grand Rapids, there were only two places listed in all the years of the Green Book. The Southern Kitchen Shack was listed only in 1939, but I know it was there before and after for a few years. And the articles that I found both in the local Grand Rapids papers as well as the historical black newspapers talked about that this was a meeting place when the local NAACP chapter was being formed and there would be speakers there and so forth. And then also they were one of only three places that sold tickets for uh, Louis Armstrong's first West Michigan appearance. The other place in Grand Rapids was the Villa Motor Court, um, this row of cottages on South Division. And the Grand Rapids Press talked about how the area there on South Division had 200 units in the area to cater to travelers throughout the year. The cold, flimsy cabins of a generation ago have given way to units with heat, hot water, and other modern conveniences. And moving north uh, to Bightley and Woodland Park. Now, these are actually two separate little communities right next door to each other. And um, the places that were actually in Woodland Park, except for one, uh, were listed in Bightley. And then one was listed under just under Woodland, but I knew it was Woodland Park. During the 1920s, several investors purchased land at Brookings, a former logging community. They platted Woodland Park as a summer resort for African Americans. It was located just 15 miles from Idlewild and catered to a clientele looking for a quieter, more restful experience. Marion and Ella Author built the first hotel and purchased private buses that drove to and from Midwestern cities, such as Detroit, Chicago, and Cleveland, bringing a steady stream of summer visitors to Woodland Park. There was a Michigan historical marker erected in 2010 that talks about the history of the park. Um, and this is the Royal Breeze Hotel. This is the first hotel um, that was adapted from the Lumber Mills Company's boarding house by Marion and Ellen Author and with an ad from the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, and here's an interior view 
of the parlor at the Royal Breeze. And for postcard collectors, they know that it's pretty rare to find interiors. Uh, but I think the reason that this survived is that Ella Author was a bit of a photo bug. And she went around taking photos that were made into postcards of various places in Woodland Park. The Pittsburgh Courier wrote up that it, the spacious Royal Breeze Hotel is located on a high bluff overlooking Brookings Lake. They have 30 large sleeping rooms available for your comfort, plus cottages on the lake, a huge dining room and lobby. Another place in Woodland Park was the Kelsonia Inn. And here's a ex nice exterior view of it, probably taken by Ella Author. And I love this view of the porch and you can see the postcard rack there. And they had an ad that ran in the green book. Now in the newspapers, I couldn't find any lengthy description of the Calsonia Inn, but it was mentioned over and over in the social columns that so-and-so was visiting, that someone was meeting someone there and so forth. Another place uh, was the Old Deer's Rest and the Pittsburgh Courier wrote that this was a wonderful lodge, the kind you see in the movies. James Edward McHugh, former waiter and cook on the Great Lakes steamers for 30 years, during which time Mr. Congenial McHugh was affectionately called Old Deer. For the last 30 of his 79 years, he has successfully operated the lodge that bears his name, Old Deer. Moving on to Idlewild, there were listed in the Green Book, 12 hotels, one motel, and 16 tourist homes, nine restaurants, four taverns, and entertainment venues. And this is the, one of the markers there. This is the general one for Idlewild. And it talks about Arthur Bragg's Idlewild Review, how they toured the country off the season, spreading the word of Idlewild. And here's a photo from their 1960 Idlewild Review with the dancers. The Idlewild Resort Company was established in 1912 by white businessmen with the idea of developing a black resort. Lots were sold, cottages, hotels, and other businesses were built, and Idlewild, known as the Black Eden, became the largest and most famous Black resort in the United States. Popular activities included swimming, fishing, boating, horseback riding, tennis, roller skating, and of course, live music and dancing. The Paradise Hotel was built in 1929, and it was the first hotel there on Paradise Lake. Now, this slide and the next are the only two that I found that were listed in the double, AAA Michigan directory from about 1945. The Oakmere Hotel had six cottages uh, with inside toilets, saddle horses, cooking facilities, and a sloping sandy beach with a raft. The other place listed in that same directory was the Lydia Inn. Uh, and they also had inside toilets and showers, linen, a dining room nearby, saddle horses and tennis. And both of those also ran ads in the black papers. The largest hotel in Idlewild was the Casablanca and the Michigan Chronicle had a nice piece about it saying it had 40 rooms, some with private baths. It also has a restaurant and cocktail lounge and new furniture throughout. Central oil heating makes it possible to keep the Casablanca open the year round. The hotel is owned by Woolsey C. Combs, a former Detroiter and now a justice of the peace in Idlewild. Moving on to some of the entertainment venues, the Purple Palace was one of Idlewild's earliest night spots and it was a bring your own establishment in those days. And the Chicago Defender wrote up in 1932 about the Purple Palace. And this is before the Green Book. Um, you would have thought a circus was coming to town. Rather, twas the opening of the Purple Palace, the golden lily of Idlewild. There was all the noise of a regular cabaret and plenty of music for dancers at the Purple Palace. The article actually went on to call for more entertainment venues in Idlewild, which we know certainly did happen. 
the Paradise Club, Paradise Gardens, um, was built in 1922 and originally hosted various kinds of social events, but by the 1950s, it was one of the most popular nightclubs in Idlewild. And the Fiesta Room there in the Paradise uh, was the hot spot. And here's a photo of little Willie John from Detroit. Uh, he's the open star of the opening show at Arthur Bragg's Fiesta Room up north in June of 56. And an ad from the Idlewilders magazine shows a picture of Art Bragg and talking about some of the people that he's bringing in, like Della Reese, T-Bone Walker, the Four Tops, and so forth. And um, Ziggy Johnson was the MC there during the summer. Another popular spot was the Flamingo Club. And this is from the historical marker. The Ho Detroit hotelier Phil Giles opened the Flamingo Club in 1955. A 1956 Chicago Defender article reported that it was classed with the top night eateries in the nation. As early as the 1920s, resorters had many options for evening activities, including card parties and dances. By the 1930s, the Islands Clubhouse had been renovated as the Idlewild Club Casino. During the next 30 years, venues like the Paradise Club and the El Morocco featured top African-American entertainers, including Sarah Vaughn, Jackie Wilson, and the Four Tops. The Idlewild's club scene declined in the 1960s, in part because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which provided equal access to employment, public places, and expanded opportunities for Black entertainers and audiences alike. The Flamingo closed by 1968. Uh, and here's a view of the exterior. And you could get a souvenir photo taken there of your party at the Flamingo. Uh, a big ad ran in the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender called Phil Giles, one of the great producers nightclub barons and he's returning to the scene Friday night when he reopens the famed Flamingo Club here for the season in 1959. Phil Giles also had a hotel in Dude Ranch and offered free riding instructions uh, and here's a photo of the Brannon family from Detroit with the horse named the Purple Palace. Also in Idlewild there was the Rosanna Tavern uh, and this was run by Sonny Sonny and his mother, Lottie Roxborough, and they were open year round right in the heart of Idlewild and survived for many years. The furthest north place that was in the Green Book was in Mackinac City, and it was the Parkview Cabins. It later became Bingham's Parkview Motel. That's the only image I could find, um, but I did see an ad uh, from the Michigan Chronicle uh, talking about the Parkview Cabins and how uh, the owner, the genial Mr. Bingham, furnished everything, including linen, and it was a good fishing spot. One of the nice surprises I found was in Utica in Shelby Township, and that is the Joe Lewis Spring Hill Farm. And yes, it is the Joe Lewis that you're thinking of. Originally, it was Peter and Sarah Larich who established Spring Hill Farm in the 1830s. They were opponents of slavery and built a hiding place in the hillside as part of the Underground Railroad. They planted a prominent cedar known as the beacon tree to mark the location. African-Americans escaping from slavery hid in the shelter while fleeing. In 1939, world heavyweight champion Joe Lewis purchased the 477 acre farm, then sold it in 1944. Um, and it did survive for a few years after that, but then gradually fell into disuse. During the Cold War, it was the site of a Nike missile battery and little of it remains today. And there was a historical marker erected in 2006. Joe Lewis was an avid equestrian and he established a riding academy at the site <clears throat> complete with a restaurant, dance hall, and lodge. He loved horses and horseback riding nearly as much as boxing. At Spring Hill Farm, he could live the life of a country squire. He welcomed visitors to the farm. Families came from Detroit for a day in the country to eat at Joe's restaurant or picnic on the grounds, take riding lessons, or attend horse shows. And then moving to Detroit, now that had the largest listing of any town in the Green Book, as might be expected. 37 hotels, two motels, and two tourist homes, 
seven restaurants, 17 taverns, nightclubs, and roadhouses. And this is the Hotel McGraw that was one of the hotels listed. And here's the famed Hotel Gotham. Uh, this was really the most elite place uh, in Detroit owned by African-Americans. Cab Calloway, Louis Armstrong, Dinah Washington stayed there as well as Martin Luther King stayed there when he led the Detroit Walk to Freedom in 1963 where he gave the first vision, his first version of I Have a Dream speech. And this is a little quote from the Langston Hughes article from the Michigan Chronicle. There is a kind of minor miracle taking place in Detroit. This miracle I speak of is the Hotel Gotham. Negroes own and manage the Hotel Gotham. If this can happen in Detroit, it can happen elsewhere. A good colored hotel need not forever be a minor miracle, but right now it was in 1945. Another prominent hotel was the Hotel Fairbairn, and they advertised that they were America's largest Negro hotel, and that was in 1950. Uh, the mot one of the motels listed was the Town Motel, and this was the third place that I found that was listed in one of the mainstream travel guides where to vacation in Michigan. And the Chicago Defender talked about its convenient location close to Woodward, Grand River Avenue, walking distance from the Olympia Sports Center, five minutes to the Henry Ford Hospital, six minutes downtown, and only two minutes to Briggs Stadium. And some of the entertainment venues um, I'm gonna talk about now. The Club Plantation was one of the early ones and that was located in the Norwood Hotel. And they called themselves the Detroit's smartest sepia nightclub, which combines all the allurements of the finest cuisine, an evening of pleasure, the exotic music in an atmosphere of relaxing comfort and featuring the quintessence of sepia entertainment with Earl Walton and his orchestra. And there they are. Club Plantation became Club Congo in 1941. It was listed for several years then in the Green Book. And Billie Holiday uh, made an appearance in 1942 and was written about in the Chicago Defender. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, came to Club Valley, that was formerly Club Three Sixes, um, and she came there in 1950, and the Michigan Chronicle ran both an ad and an article about her appearance. Sporty's Music Bar was known as the swankiest bar in Paradise Valley, and it could seat 300 people. Um, the ad here from 1947 talks about T-Bone Walker coming. Another hot spot was the Frolic Show Bar, and they had continuous top name entertainment, and you could also get a souvenir photo taken there. In 1947, um, Louis Armstrong came, and he was written up in the Chronicle, both with an ad, and there isn't much to say about Armstrong, except that he is a master of his instrument, a dean of jazz, a musician's musician, and a whole lot of other things that add up to the fact that Louis Armstrong is the papa of jazz. Another hot spot was the Flame Show Bar uh, in Detroit. And this was um, called themselves the most beautiful black and tan in the Midwest. And the black and tan referred to that they also, uh, it was both a, a mixed audience of black and white people. And they brought in a lot of big names. Uh, these are several ads from the Detroit Free Press in the early 50s, Joan Turner and Mabel Scott and so forth. And uh, MC, uh, Ziggy Johnson was the MC there. Here's Jackie Wilson, uh, written up in the Michigan Chronicle in 1960 that he's coming to the Flame Show Bar. And our last place uh, is an Inkster. It's the Mona Lisa Hotel. And you can see it's quite a modern place with air conditioning, free TV and a radio and telephone in every room. And the Detroit Trib Tribune wrote about that hundreds of prominent figures gathered to celebrate the grand opening of the finest Negro owned motel, not only in Inkster, but throughout the nation. This ultra modern establishment is owned by Mr. W. Mackey of Inkster. So that brings us to the end of our tour of some of the Michigan places in the Green Book. And I wanted to read this quote from the 1948 edition of the Green Book that Victor Green wrote. There will be a day sometime in the near future when this guide will not have to be published. 
That is when we as a race will have equal opportunities and privileges in the United States. It will be a great day for us to suspend this publication for then we can go wherever we please and without embarrassment. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 invalidated the Jim Crow laws, accelerated the process of integrating public accommodations and eased, but did not eliminate the difficulty of travel for black motorists. And as Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, discrimination and narrow-mindedness. And I think the Green Book taught us that. So I just wanna mention um, some of the newspapers that you might use if you're doing research um, through the Grand Rapids Public Library, uh, through the ProQuest Historical Newspapers, Black Newspaper Collection, that is uh, remote access is available with the Grand Rapids Public Library card, but you can go in person to any of the branches and access it. And the three that I newspapers that I mentioned uh, were the Chicago Defender, Michigan Chronicle, and Pittsburgh Courier. But certainly there are other, the other newspapers also had Michigan things, but those were the three main that I found that related to tourism and travel. Uh, the Library of Michigan has remote access to some newspapers with the Library of Michigan card, which is available to Michigan residents. And they have the Detroit Free Press from 1831 to 1999, the Grand Rapids Press from 1893 to the present. And uh, they also have the Michigan Chronicle from 1939 to 2010. And then don't forget, there's also local newspapers of, of whatever town, what area you're researching. And I certainly found things in local papers as well as the black papers, but not nearly as much. And then the Central Michigan University Clark Historical Library, they have the digital Michigan newspaper portal. And that is over a thousand digital newspapers that represents all 83 Michigan counties. So uh, good luck in your research and so forth. And um, I'm ending the presentation uh, that we are grateful to our partner organizations that made the detective, history detectives possible. And don't forget to go on to part two by George Bayard. He's calling it Exploring the Other Side of History comparing local and national news reports using African-American newspaper data. So I thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.